you to get your Bibles and turn to the book of Matthew. Turn to the book of Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. It will start at verse 28 through 30. And it reads as such. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Again, I just feel like reading that again. Matthew eleven twenty eight and 30. And I'm going to read the 29th verse again. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. I want to talk this morning. Lord. Help me to rest. Lord, help me to rest. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity, um, this privilege to be able to speak to your people. Father, I ask right now that you would anoint my words, that you would anoint the listeners. Let this word go forth with clarity, with conviction and power. Holy Spirit, have your way and we'll be forever careful to give you the praise and glory that is due your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're excited that you joined us. We're super excited. Lord, help me to rest. Do you need some rest? Are you stressed or maybe frazzled? What about worn out or burnout? Somebody listening, you may not be all the way there, but you're really close. Some feel as if, as if one more thing happens. They just may lose it. And they're barely, barely holding on. If that's you, this word is for you. Lord, help me to rest. Some of you may be hurt or heartbroken. There are others who you feel like you're spinning in the mud. Or maybe you're trying to get somewhere and it's just like you can't get there. Or maybe you feel that something is missing in your life. This word is for you as well. Lord, help me to rest. How many know we need rest? This word is written to a Jewish audience. They have been given the people of God had been given the law of God through Moses as a way to have relationship with him and had practiced this way for thousands of years. There were ceremonies and feasts and feast days and holy days and sacrifices and ordinances and Sabbaths and high Sabbaths. Everything had to be exact down to the last minute detail as God prescribed. Even the furniture, the utensils, the altar, and the offerings, everything had to be precise. They also had to have a mediator. An extreme pressure was on the high priest when he went into the holy place And it was on him to get it right. There were set times to offer sacrifices. The high priest had to have specific clothes to wear. He had cloaks. He had a hat. He had bells to wear. And he 
And according to the law, he could not even break a sweat with all of these clothes on. He had to go in one time and offer an offering for his for himself. He had to then come out, undress, wash himself, redress, and then go back in to offer up the offering for the nations. Whew. And to add to that, if he did not get it right, he would die on the spot. You're talking about pressure. So the constant fear of death was always looming over them. Besides all of the cumbersome mosaic rites, the Pharisees had manufactured hundreds upon hundreds of additional laws to be kept along with the Mosaic rites. So the Pharisees added laws to the laws. It was a very cumbersome and burdensome process that had to be repeated over and over because their peace offerings, their trespass offerings, even though how great they may have been, it was never enough. So Jesus Christ comes on the scene in the midst of this Judean culture and he comes in to bring a new and living way. He comes preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He, he pre preaching his own gospel rather. A new and a living way. He comes preaching the gospel of the kingdom excuse me, yes, the gospel of the kingdom. And he says to this Jewish audience, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Now the labor that Jesus was referring to was the way that they had been worshiping God up unto this time. And even though God himself had given this way to them, it was never his intention, I want you to hear me, for man to relate to him through religion. It was, I'll say it again, it was never God's intention for man to relate to him through religion. Well, why did God give it? Well, see, Adam was created in the image and the likeness of God, and he had direct fellowship with him. So there was no need for religion. He walked with him. Uh, Adam walked in total harmony with God. He walked in the spirit of God. He and God were on one accord. But after Adam committed high treason in the garden, this direct fellowship was broken. He no longer had the spirit of God, so he is lost. And sin now became a barrier between God and man. But because of God's love, he still wanted to fellowship with man. Isn't that awesome? He could have just cut him completely off. But because he loved him, he still wanted to fellowship with man. So he established, hear me, a temporary system of religion for man to relate to him until the barrier of sin would finally be removed and the spiritual relationship restored. Hear this profound statement. Religion was made for those who don't have a spiritual relationship with God. Hmm. So Jesus says something to them that's quite astounding. He says, come unto me. He presents himself as the answer. Come unto me. And this is the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is not about keeping the law. 
It's not about legalism or performance. The gospel of the kingdom is about coming to a person. You hear me? And that person is Jesus Christ. He says, come unto me. And I need to be crystal clear about this because many have made the kingdom about ownership and the acquisition of things. But it is not about that. It is about coming into the relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. Because every person all is already born into another kingdom. And that is the kingdom of Satan. Yes, we are all, when we are born into this world, we are born into the kingdom of Satan because of our relationship with Adam. But one becomes a part of the other kingdom, which is the kingdom of God, by relationship with the last Adam, who is Jesus Christ. So he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Can someone say, Lord, help me to rest. Lord, help me to rest. The Old Testament prophets prophesied about a Messiah to come who would save the people from their sin and destroy the yoke of bondage. So Christ announces here that he is the only source of rest. And let us understand this rest is not just a sweet by and by rest. Yes, it is a, an eternal rest. And we thank God for that. But it is also a right now rest. Did you hear me? It's a right now rest. Spiritual rest. Emotional rest. Physical rest. And then ultimately, eternal rest. Lord, help me to rest. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, this rest that Jesus was speaking of, since I said earlier, he was speaking to a Jewish audience. So they understood rest, if you would translate it, that rest in that tense meant, I mean, in that text meant Sabbath. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath was the holiest day of the week. It was the day that they did no work or ceremonies. And so what Jesus was telling them is come unto me because I am your Sabbath. Wait a minute. That was jaw dropping to them. I am your Sabbath. And that's why he healed on the Sabbath. And even in Matthew uh, chapter 12, verse one, the disciples, uh, they pluck corn in the field uh, on the Sabbath. He healed on the Sabbath. And in verse eight of Matthew 12, it lets us know that Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. So what he was saying is that in me, I am your Sabbath. In me, I am your rest. Uh And it's not just on a particular day of the week, uh, but he says, I am your Sabbath. I am your perpetual Sabbath. And, but you will not just find rest, you know, from just working physically, but he said, I can give your soul's rest, rest to your soul. Lord, help me to rest. Because sin was the problem. And sin brings unrest. Now, there are different types of rest or different kinds of rest we'll get into. But we're going to deal with this one in particular for a moment here. Um, Sin brings unrest. See, there is a void in every person. That void is unrest. But there's a void in every person. And they will seek to fill this void with something. If not from the things of the world, then they will try to fill this void with religion. And both of these things are futile and will never satisfy. But Christ, Jesus Christ, is the only one 
that can fill this void and bring rest. You hear me? Pills can't do it. Sex can't do it. Money can't do it. Power cannot do it. A political party can't do it. Family can't do it. Friends can't do it. Only Christ can give you true rest. Hypnosis can't do it. Therapy can't do it. Burning sage can't do it. Palm reading can't do it. A crystal ball cannot do it. The preacher can't do it. The church can't do it. Moving to another state won't do it. Getting a job won't do it. Getting married won't do it. Going on vacation won't do it. Having the time of your life won't do it. Nothing can bring rest but the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't learn how to rest in him, you will forever find yourself searching. You'll find yourself searching. I know I'm talking to somebody. You've searched and you've searched and you're still empty. But I came to give you a true source of rest. Rest from your rest in your soul. Rest in your innermost being. I wish somebody could just say, Lord, help me to rest. Lord, help me to rest. And Jesus Christ doesn't just bring the new covenant. He is the new covenant. The apostles emphatically declare in every book of the New Testament from Acts to Revelation that Christ, the person, and what he did at Calvary is all we need. 1 Corinthians 15 and 57, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So your victory comes through the person and what he did. Y'all hear me? Your holiness doesn't come through <clears throat> what you do. Your holiness comes through the person of Jesus Christ and what he did. Your success comes to comes through the person and what he did. So the gospel of the kingdom is about bringing you to a person who is Jesus Christ. And, the, and it's through the person that, that everything you need is supplied through the person and what he did. So that's why he told them to come unto me. And actually, this is Jesus Christ. This is his first general invitation to all men. Not only does he say, come unto me, but then he says to take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He says, take my yoke. Wait a minute. I thought you were free. We were free. He said, take my yoke. In other words, he says, I have a yoke too. Jesus says, I want you to listen here. Not a yoke of bondage like you had with the law. Instead of the yoke of the law, Jesus says, take my yoke, which is the yoke of grace. Now hear me. I need to explain this because some people think and they shun. Uh, see, we have two uh, sets of people. There are those who embrace grace because they think that it means you can do uh, you can do what you want to do. And then there are those who shun grace because they think it's all about performance and what you do and what you don't do and what you wear and what you don't wear. But I need to explain a certain part of this because some people think, again, grace means you can do what you want. But being in grace, there's a yoke of grace. So being in grace doesn't mean that you're unrestrained. Y'all hear what I'm saying? He said, take my yoke. In other words, you disconnect from sin, but you connect to him. Holiness is not legalism. Holiness is not a yoke. A bondage. It's a yoke of freedom. It's a yoke of grace. I need somebody to hear this. Because we have a whole generation of people that reject holiness because they think folk are trying to bind them in tradition and they call it religion. 
Now, there is such a thing as the yoke of tradition, but true holiness and living for God is not um, legalism. Now, people have made it that. People have made it a yoke of traditionalism, but it was never designed that way. Come on, y'all. We got this wrong. See, because when you're holy, you're not bound by the law. You hear me? You're bound by Christ. Somebody said, Lord, help me to rest. I'm going to show you how to rest. Come on. See, when you have his yoke, see, you can't do what you want to do and go where you want to go. He tells you to be ye holy for I am holy. He says, come out from among them and be ye separate. He tells you to touch not the unclean thing. He says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He tells you to walk in the light. But he says, take my yoke. You may say, well, that is hard. That's hard uh, if you're trying to do it by the law and you're trying to do it in your own strength. Yes, it is hard. It becomes a yoke of bondage. But he says, take my yoke upon you. And learn of me. Learn of me. Come on, come on, come on. See, see, and he says that my yoke is easy. Why is it easy? Remember, we told you that the law was burdensome. And the reason it was burdensome is because the law told you what to do, but it didn't give you the power to do it. But Jesus says, my yoke is easy. Uh huh. I, I kept the law and I give you the power. Not the power to keep the law again, but I give you the power to make you what the law could never make you. And that's holy. I give you the power to make you what the law could never make you. And that is have right standing with God. I give you power to make you what the law could never make you. And that is righteous before God. So now you don't need to look to the law, to the old covenant. You don't need Moses to tell you not to steal because when you get his yoke, he puts do not steal in here. He puts thou shall not steal in your heart. So now he gives you do right power. I wish somebody would say do right power. Do right power is a power to do right. So now there is no such thing as the can't help it. He, he says with my yoke, he said, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. He also says, behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over, power, over all the power of the enemy. In another place, it says he's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with the exceeding joy. And he gives a benediction. In other words, it's the last part of it. He says to the only wise God, our savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Which means it is so he's able to keep you from falling. Oh my God, Lord, help me to rest. There is not one problem. There is not one weight not one bondage that Christ did not address in his redemptive, efficacious, vicarious work on the cross. Efficacious means a remedy. Vicarious means uh, substitutionary. So there is not one thing he did not address in his efficacious, vicarious work on the cross. Christ conquered everything that was against me. You may be asking, well, what was against me? He destroyed the devil. Satan was against us. Come on here. People think telling that you got to go and de destroy the devil. Oh, no, you don't. He defeated the devil. Hebrews 2 and 14 says he destroyed him that had the power of death. And that is the devil. Now, the devil have not been annihilated now. So, so, so he, he, he still exists, but, but his power. He has been rendered powerless against those who believe in Christ. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Not only was Satan, but he, he and his demons and his works and his strategies, come on, were against you. But Jesus addressed that. Colossians 2 and 15, I hope y'all can handle this. It says, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a public show, triumphing over them in it. 
what else was against us? We already saw that the 10 uh, commandments and all of the ordinances was against us. Colossians 2 and 14 says blocking out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us and contrary to us. Listen at this. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Galatians 3 and 13, for Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. So what else was against us? He addressed everything against you. Sin was against you. But Romans 6 and 14 said, sin shall not have dominion over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. What else was against me? The biggest thing that was against me was me. I was against me. Come on. In my flesh dwell no good thing. I'm my greatest enemy. But Jesus even, even provided the remedy for that. Luke 9, 23, he says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. Come on, come on. So he, he provided a way for that. I was against me. Come on, Colossians 2 and 10 tells us, it says, ye are complete in him. I need somebody to say, I am complete. Come on, the Lord wants to give you rest. He wants to help you to rest. He came to give you rest from personal things like rejection, abandonment, the need to feel whole, the need to be accepted. Come on, see, I'm talking about this stuff that's 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 way down, the, the stuff that you deal with after, after you get through shouting and praising the Lord. He wants to give you rest from the need to perform. Come on. He wants to make you complete, to make you whole, and to give you rest from your memories. Do you hear what I'm saying? To give you rest from your past, to give you rest from your present experiences. He wants to give you rest and heal you. He came to make you complete so that you can make sound decisions and wise choices. Christ has done everything necessary to get you all the way together. Lord, help me to rest. And the church has not presented Christ and him crucified as the answer. I'll say it again. The church has not presented Christ and him crucified as the answer. They've presented it as an answer, some of them. And they've had people to put their trust in works, in their confession, and everything else. But Hebrew 12 um, and 2 lets us know that he's the author and the finisher of our faith. The author and the finisher, talking about Christ, of our faith. Now, this faith does not refer to your personal faith. When he's saying of our faith, that is a noun. It's talking about the faith. It's talking about the gospel. That's why Jude tells us to earnestly contend for the faith. So he's the author and finisher of the faith, the thing that we put our faith in, the thing that we trust in. He is the author of that. My God, my God. And so what you must do, as I just said, to put your personal faith right there and rest. Did you hear what I said? Put your faith in what Christ has done and his ability to accomplish everything in your life and rest right there. Many of you, the reason you are stressed is because you're trying to figure it out. You're trying to work it out. You're trying to come up with a scheme. You're trying to come with a plan. You're looking at your money and you're looking at your, your, your obligations and you're saying that it just don't match. But you got to understand that. That is not your job to try to figure out. God wants you to put your faith in him and rest. Somebody said, teach me how to rest. Come on. I know you may have children and they're acting crazy and they're doing everything except for, 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 for what you taught them. Come on. And you've been praying for them. And, it, and instead of getting better, it seems like they are getting worse. But you're like that because sometimes we forget that it's finished. So I have to remind you to put your faith in Christ and what he is did and what he has done and trust him to bring everything to pass that's supposed to come to pass in your life. And even when things that you prayed for don't come to pass. Don't move your faith from him. Keep your faith on him. Keep resting in him because if it didn't come through like you thought it was, trust me, God has a better plan. 
I wish I could get somebody to say, Lord, help me to rest. Help me to rest. Help me to cast my cares on you. Help me to cast, to throw all of my anxieties on you. See that scripture that says, cast your cares upon him. That means to throw like you throw something in the garbage can. Cast your cares upon him for he careth for you. Oh, somebody said, Lord, help me to rest. Came the good news this morning. So we preach Christ and him crucified. Christ, the hope of glory. Christ, the soon coming king. Christ and his gospel. He is the restorer of the breach. The repairer of lives that are broken. Repairer of lives that are shattered by sin and oppression. Been devastated by religion. Come on. He's a repairer of lives that have been abused and molested. Come on. He, he is the repairer of the lives of those who've been devastated by the doctrine of Aaron. Of error, rather, excuse me, and the false prophet. See, we cannot give you an inheritance. We cannot give you eternal life. We cannot be there with you all day and all night and hold your hand. But we present, I present you to the one who can. And his name is Jesus. And no one but Jesus can give you rest. No one but Jesus can save. To the utmost, he saves. He heals. He delivers. And he is coming back again. We present you, I present you to the one that can save your soul. The one who can break that addiction. Y'all hear me. He'll give you rest. To the one that can heal your body and to heal your mind. Calm that anxiety. Help you to go, when you go to sleep, to really get some rest. I present you to the one that can lift those burdens. Give you the Holy Ghost. Renew your spirit, show you how to walk, show you how to live, make you like him to give you power and to give you peace that surpasses understanding. He will give you rest. I'm going to end this like I started. With question, do you need rest? Do you feel like something is missing in your life? Do you have a void? Are you hurt? Heartbroken? Just so disappointed and let down that it's hard for you to come up? Some of you, so many people are depressed. And I want you to understand is that your feelings are real. But there is hope. And the hope is Jesus Christ. Because what the devil does, de depression happens when you commune with demon spirits. Listen to what I'm saying. The thoughts may come. The feelings may come. They're real. But what happens is the devil ministers to you. He brings it. And then his thoughts become your thoughts. Then you start feeling a certain way. Then he brings on the spirit of heaviness. A weight. Somebody here know what I'm talking about. Lord, somebody need to lift up your hands right now and say, Lord, help me to rest. And he's going to break that spirit of depression. Lord, help me to rest. And so, you, and so what happens is you end up having fellowship with him without actually realizing it. But God comes to give you rest from that. Rest from depression. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He didn't say come unto works. He didn't say come and try something else and come into religion and pray harder and do all of that. Because many of us have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Fasted and did all of that and we still got the same problem. It is because we are, are not resting our faith in the right source. You hear what I'm saying? 
He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he'll give it to you if you ask the Lord to help you. And if you ask him to help you, he will. We suffer so much loss. And there are a lot of people who are burdened. Rightfully so. You're grieving. You're in bereavement. There's nothing wrong with, with grieving in and of itself. But what happens is um, you cannot allow it to consume you. When you allow it to consume you and you park right there. Come on, then the, the devil has leeway to make mincemeat out of you. But ask God to help you to rest. And I promise you, I'm, I know what I'm talking about. He will do it each and every time. If you're not saved, lift your hands and say, Lord, give my soul rest. He'll, he will give you rest. He'll he will save you. If you're anxious, if, you, if you're burdened, if you're discouraged or whatever it is, it's the same answer. It's the same source. It's Jesus. It's Christ and him crucified. The gospel of the kingdom is not about business and entrepreneurship. It is about bringing you to a person and what that person did. And he's the answer, the solution, and the source to everything. Lord, help me to rest. Can you give God praise, somebody? Until next time, keep looking up. Praise God.